You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have R.A. Salvatore back on the show with me today. Uh, he has an amazing new novel. It's the uh, the third in a, in a trilogy, the Generations trilogy. It's called Relentless, and it's, of course, a Drizzt novel. Uh, if you're a fan of fantasy, this is a must-have for your shelf. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, it's been a while. It's good to be back. <laughs> oh, so happy I'm glad to have we do you. this over the internet. It's too hot where you are right now. Oh, I, let me tell you what. It's uh we had a, a temperature of 106 yesterday, so that's uh that you know, that's a peak no summertime. <laughs> oh man. Um Bob, you you've had an illustrious career writing Drizzt and uh, making some of the most beloved fantasy stories uh, of all time uh, do you remember uh, as a kid or uh, you know when you're at an impressionable age what the first book or series or author that you read that just completely transported you to another place and and let you know that this was a possibility that this could happen to people um well it's two different answers to that okay. first um when i was a kid no uh, um, I mean, as far as that it could happen to me, if you will. but yeah. the books that really took me away were the Charlie Brown books. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Charlie Brown. And I had, I'm talking kindergarten, first grade, second grade. I had a deal with my mom that she'd let me bag school as long as I was getting A's. <laughs> and I would stay home a lot, like 30 days a year. They, probably, they wouldn't let me pass nowadays, but I was getting all A's, so she didn't care. And I would spend the time with my Charlie Brown books. I have a bunch of first edition, you know, it's the, the comic strip, the Peanuts comic strip. Right. I have first editions from the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s of those books. And uh, I would just sit there and read them all day long and try and figure out what messages he was trying to send. And it's funny because the older I get, the more I realize how wise he was how wise charles schultz was when he wrote those and then i was a big reader for a while early on uh you know i'm not sure i i'm getting my memory will put all the books i ever read back into that place all the books i ever read early but books like uh, watership down i think came along a little later wind in the willows i remember loving those books but then some weird things happened i went to school and in school, they would give you, you know, first it was just, you know, write this sentence 23 times and it's because we want you to get used to writing a sentence. And so I was just bored with the whole thing. It didn't really challenge me. We didn't do a lot of reading. We did the SRA. They had these um, boxes of these lessons you would do, but we didn't do a lot of book reading in school until about junior high school and then they started giving me books like Moby Dick, Ethan Fromm and Silas Miner and I was just like god and I hated it. <laughs> I just hated reading those books. I mean I was 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old. I want to go play I want to go play baseball. I want to go play football. I want to you know like girls who you know, and they're giving me books like Ethan Fromm and Silas Moner, and I have no idea. I don't care about the characters. I don't care at all about the books, honestly. You know, now older, I probably would appreciate them, but I'll never go back to them because of those first horrible experiences. <laughs> and it, it, then when I got that, when I got to high school, the, the books they were giving us were these gigantic textbooks that had like a paragraph of Falk, which was like one sentence, right? Right. And a paragraph <laughs> of Hemingway, which was like not even an inch long in the book. And we were supposed to like analyze the paragraph or, and it, it, that's not how you read. That's not, 
you know, I'm not engaged with the characters. I'm not, there's nothing there for me. And it got to the point that I was still writing, though. Every now and then I would write. I would write a short story or something. And I did take a science fiction class, which was great. Um, Because I got to read Ray Bradbury. And, you know, some of the other greats. Uh, But I wasn't really into reading. I was busy. I was, uh, I had a very, very active life in high school. And it wasn't until I got to, I actually started college as a math major. It was, I was technically undeclared, but I was going for math computer science. My sister gave me The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. And when I read those books, I, she came to me for Christmas and I didn't want books. I wanted money. I had a car that would run. I had to keep fixing it. But a month after, a couple, about a month and a half after she gave me the books, we had this gigantic blizzard up here in New England, shut everything down for a week. And I was trapped, 19 years old, trapped in my house with my mom and my dad. And that was it for a week. You couldn't go anywhere. There were no roads. They shut everything down. They didn't have the equipment they have today to get things going again. So I said, what the hell? And I put on Fleetwood Mac's Rumors album. And the sun was coming album. up, and I opened up, I opened up The Hobbit, and it said in the hole in the ground, they lived The Hobbit. And I'm like, okay, this is kind of interesting. So I went back and I actually read the forward, and the forward but was by Peter Beagle, the Peter S. Beagle, who did The Last Unicorn, right? for example. And he wrote this wonderful forward about, we honor all the wrong people, thieves, uh, thieves carrying flags and villains carrying whatever i don't remember exactly but it was just wonderful thing saying escape isn't really a bad word and then i read those books and i was blown away and i i was not a reader at this time at all but i read all four of them the hobbit and the three lord of the rings books like two or three times in those in that week and i don't read fast at all it takes me a month to read a book but then it didn't because i was so into them. and so when i got back to college i changed my major and uh, communications, because now all of my electives became lit courses. And <laughs> now I started reading James Joyce and Shakespeare and Dante and Milton and Chaucer and all the rest. But I was understanding it because now I was an adult. Now I was able to process those books in the same way I processed the Peanuts comic books when I was a kid. And I just fell in love with it. And but I always I, even with all the classics I was reading, my love was fantasy because of Tolkien, I think. But at that time, there was no Internet. This was 1978 to 1981 or two. There was no there was no Internet. We had one bookstore in town. I so I grabbed every fantasy novel I could find, which meant I think there was an Anne McCaffrey but the main ones were Terry Brooks's Shannara, early Shannara books and Stephen Donaldson's Lord Fowles Bane, then Michael Moorcock's Elric and Fritz Leibert's Fafford and Gray Mouser. And that was really about all I could find. And when I ran out of books to read, I just decided to write one. And I wrote a book called Echoes of the Fourth Magic while I was working at a plastics factory. Do you, you talked about coming back to Chaucer and Joyce and, and all of those kind of luminaries. Do you attribute understanding and being able to appreciate those due to your age and your maturity, or does it have to do with finding um, uh, Tolkien first and then, you know, understanding what literature could do for you? Do you was it that, that you were finally old enough to appreciate it or was it because there was this book that opened you up to those possibilities? Both. that's a great question. That really is a great question. It's both. I was older, and so I and and I wasn't reading just because I had to read. You know, when I was in college, I was working two or three jobs right around to pay for college, but I took it very I took college very seriously. So it wasn't that oh man I got to read this I got to read this James Joyce novella. It was that okay this is my next my next thing to do, and so I put the sports aside. I put the girls aside, you know, (laughs) chasing girls aside. And I, and I read the novella and I actually paid attention to what I was reading. And yeah, but, but it was that the way Tolkien had engrossed me when I couldn't do anything else reminded me of when I was a kid. It brought that off screaming back to me to, 
that it wasn't a bad thing to be sitting there reading. So I, I paid attention. You know, when I was when I was reading Ethan Fromm in the eighth grade, I don't even remember the book or Silas Miner or A Mill on the Floss or whatever it was called. I I, I didn't care about the subjects. I was right. being thrown into something that really had nothing to do with anything I cared about. Now, when I was in college, I was picking the lit courses I wanted, and I was reading them as part of a curriculum that made sense to me. Plus, I was an adult. I was a much more sophisticated reader, and I was willing to let these authors take me on the same journey that Tolkien took me on. And I did really what I think very great move for me, and I, I wish more col- – I think more colleges probably do this now, but – when I was up at the, I was at a state college in Massachusetts. They used to pair things up. So if you were taking Amer- American Lit one and U.S. History one, you were getting what the times were like when the person was writing the book, and that made a huge difference because it, I wasn't just reading a book and being transported into a story. I was being transported into the world of the writer as well. So it was a tremendous escape. In other words, I wasn't approaching it as something I had to do so I could go do what I wanted to do. It was something I wanted to do because right. of that. Uh, that Peter S. Beagle forward uh, that you mentioned, and you know the the idea that that you were kind of given permission uh, to escape a little bit. You know that 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 he told us, you know, it, it's okay to to go somewhere else with one of these stories. Um, do, do you think that that's one reason that uh, that fantasy is is such a strong love for you that these these ideas of myth and magic and uh, you know where things are bigger than than real life and more you know the stakes are higher um what do you think it is about those kinds of stories and and the magic and the sorcery and you know all of the things that our mundane world don't provide to us what what do you think it is about those that we love so much in fantasy literature i think there's a lot of things first we live in a world of eight billion people yeah and you can feel very insignificant and you can feel like you can't make a difference very easily in a world of eight billion people so isn't it nice to have a story where just a normal person can rise up and kill the dragon and save the town. Uh, so that 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 was that's a nice feeling that you can make a difference in the world because generally the hero's journey in a fantasy novel has consequence for the world. And since it's the hero, it's usually a pretty good consequence for the world. So there's something comforting in that. I think there's also so I'm I'm a scientist by nature. I, um, you know, but I love watching those Saturday morning shows where people are convinced that Bigfoot is behind the tree over there and they're scaring <laughs> the hell out of themselves. In the world. I love that. Yeah. Because it's nice to think that there are things we still have yet to learn. And there's so many, right? You know, one of the, when, when I'm signing books through my wife's uh, online store or whatever, one of the quotes that people always want me to put in the books is, I would not want to live in a world without dragons. For that is a world without magic, and that is a world without faith. And I think there's truth to that. I think that the idea that everything can be explained by science is comforting on one hand and terrifying on the other. So to me, Always leaving open the possibilities of something more is 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 a dare I say spiritual experience as well. Want to grow as a writer and take your writing to the next level? Give Pro Writing Aid a try. Pro Writing Aid is a grammar checker, style editor, and writing mentor in one package. Pro Writing Aid will never replace a human editor. Rather, it helps you self-edit to a deeper level so that when you send it off to an editor, they will be able to focus on the meat of your writing and not spend their time fixing basic writing issues. Pro Writing Aid is the only platform that offers world-class grammar and style checking combined with more in-depth reports to help you strengthen your writing. Our unique combination of suggestions, articles, videos, and quizzes makes writing fun and interactive. Writing can be grammatically perfect but still feel awkward and clumsy. 
Pro Writing Aid searches out elements like repetitiveness, vague wording, sentence length variation, over dependence on adverbs, passive voice, over complicated sentence structures, and so much more. Nothing makes a writer lose credibility faster than spelling and grammar mistakes. Submit clean, error free writing. Go to ProWritingAid.com and use code HANK20 for 20% off of Pro Writing Aid Premium. Pro Writing Aid, check it out today. I think that's a great uh, a great answer. W- one thing that I find really interesting about a lot of fantasy uh, stories is that the the time period that they take place in uh, is usually uh, akin to what we might call the Middle Ages or, or Dark Ages, uh, and and human progress has kind of stopped there, or uh, you, you know that that's the, the magic has taken over and. Uh, you know, human progress as we think of it now goes a different direction. Is that because of magic? Um, what do you think it is about, you know, the, the place and the, the time of these kinds of stories? And, and when we think of a, you know, kind of a perfect fantastical world, it's always in the past. It seems like, uh, you know, in, in a better world, we wouldn't have progressed the way that we have in, in modern times. Do you ever think about that? Like how come there are no computers and cell phones and things like that in fantasy stories? Almost everything we have is, was created out of need. Yeah. And if you've got, if you've got priests who can create food and water and heal the sick and you've got wizards that can throw fireballs and lightning bolts, there's not a, there's not a lot you're going to need that's going to push you forward. If you look at the rise of the empires of humankind, um, a lot of it happened because of the need for more land or the need for more resources. That's what all the games are about when you play all the games about conquering the world, right? And when you have magic, not only would you not build a gun, but if the technology started getting a little too strong and it made the wizards nervous, they'd probably shut it down. <laughs> sure. And then, of course, the biggest reason is because that's the way Tolkien did. And Tolkien created the genre. And, you know, there are a lot of people who try to break out of it. The genre, you've got cyberpunk and you've got, you know, grimdark and all the other things. And, and you, so now I think you're seeing more diversity in that. But particularly when I started in the business, this was all, this was all like, Western European, mostly, uh, Middle Ages stuff. It, it was the folklore of, of the, fin, the Finnish people and the, and the, I think that's where he got his elves, right? And, and the, the Nordic people and the, the Brits and the Celts. So I think it just started there. It's, it's definitely moved a, a much bigger scope now. But remember, when I started writing fantasy, there weren't that many people writing fantasy. Right. You know, we all knew each other. I know all the all the authors from those days. I've met them all because there weren't that many of us. That's really funny, Bob. Um, when we think about fantasy stories uh, that we kind of take for granted now, um, this is a, a, a subset, a genre that that's not that old. I mean, if we trace it back to Lord of the Rings, we're, I mean, if you go back to the to the earliest, um, you know, um, shreds of Lord of the Rings, I guess we could go back to World War One, but it didn't really come to maturity and then become published and all of that until what the 40s. Uh, and then you could argue that that Tolkien didn't really reach his greatest popularity until maybe the 70s. Um, you know, this, this was something that, that, that he alone seemed to be blazing a trail for a while. Um, but it's really the last couple, three, four decades that yeah. fantasy stories have, have really become a thing. Um, when you look from 2020 and as crazy as 2020 is, and that that's a whole different conversation. Um, but looking at the, the landscape, the scope of fantasy, uh, as, as we like to call it, um, what do you what do you feel about where fantasy is now? Um, where can we go? Uh, do, you know, do you do you have thoughts about kind of the the you know what 
what a, a typical fantasy story is in 2020? Uh, no, I don't. Because <laughs> I don't know how it's going to all play out. I think that what happened is Terry Brooks is, and Stephen Donaldson, really Delray Books, are the ones I most credit with creating the genre. There was actually a Time Magazine article about Terry after Sword of Shannon came out that said that he had basically created, proven that fantasy could be bestsellers in the modern world. And that kind of created the genre. Then, of course, Dungeons and Dragons came out. And a lot of people were playing it. And it was really the only cooperative game I can think of of its era. You had the military games from like Avalon Hill and you had things like Monopoly and then Scrabble and all the, the other types of games. It was a unique experience. And fantasy kind of went that way and built with that. Then in the mid-80s, of course, the Dragonlance books, then the Forgotten Realms books, the late 80s, just you know took everything by storm and the genre started to explode. And next you have Robert Jordan and then J.K. Rowling, of course, just piles on. And George Martin, and it, it just, it became, and then, and then it made the leap to mainstream. And I think one of the biggest reasons is computer graphics. Computer graphics lend themselves so beautifully to video games involving bit fantasy. So you have a generation that grew up playing games like Warcraft, Orcs versus Humans, then World of Warcraft and EverQuest. And that just bolstered the genre and also made the jump from just this niche market I used to go to San Diego Comic Con when there were, what, 10,000 people there? Okay, back in the right. 90s. Right. Gen Con had 10,000, 15,000 tops for years and years and years in Milwaukee. Gen Con has 100,000 now. San Diego Comic Con is probably 350, 400,000 people in and about that convention center every July that we don't have COVID. So the genre made the jump to mainstream. And now it is like the Western. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, the Westerns dominated. Uh, they dominated the bookshelves. They dominated the movie theaters. And there were dozens of them that kept cropping up all over the place on the three channels we could watch on TV. So special effects, video games, action adventure. And I think the other thing about fantasy, and this is what's really been called into question now. And this is why I say I don't know where it's going to. The other thing about fantasy is when I started, I always thought of fantasy as war without guilt, right? Because you knew your enemy was a monster. That's all. Now the sen now it's jumped mainstream. The sensibilities on that are changing. And I'm not sure how that's all going to play out yet. Uh, I think there are a lot of good things coming out of it. But I don't know. I'm not sure yet. It, it seems like the fantasy books may become more like just mainstream books with exotic characters in them. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, do you think fantasy is a, a, a good way to uh, to look at things that we believe and uh, to, to play out uh, morality tales, for, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, in a different place? I think it's always place. used for that, right? Yeah. It's always been used. Um, and I can tell you right now the way I approach my writing. I approach my writing as a way for me to make sense of a world that has never made sense for me. Not since I was a little kid. Um, I've always looked at the world and said, boy, things shouldn't be like this. Since I was a little kid. So, and then I ask myself, I, I'm always asking myself, what would it feel like to be that person. When I wrote The Highwayman, it was because of someone I knew who had cerebral palsy and was very high functioning human being, but you couldn't miss the fact that he had cerebral palsy when he was walking down the street by the way he had to walk just right. to get around. And I always wondered what that felt like. So I wrote The Highwayman because then I could explore it through characters and try and use anecdotes with the characters to try to give me an idea of what that feels like. Uh, I, I grew up watching Muhammad Ali protesting and, and the, the riots of the 60s. And 
all the strife that went on for years and years and years. And one of the books that was very influential to me was a book called Black Like Me. It was about a white guy who made himself black with um, some pigmentation. I don't know how he did it. It was maybe melanin injections. I don't even know what he did. But I, rem- I don't remember much about the book except that his experience as a black man in America was very different than his experience as a white man. And what does that feel like? So I write my books as part of my own journey in life. And I ask myself questions about love and, and death and, and relationships and the perspective. Is perspective really the biggest determination of what is evil and what is good? Right? Right. I'll give you a perfect example. When I wrote Homeland, uh, Dritz has taken on a raid. You may, you may remember this story yeah. when, he, when he's out of the academy. And he comes to the surface and they attack an elven group, a surface elves. And they slaughter them. And Dritz is deemed a hero because they thought he killed the child, but he actually saved the child. He didn't kill her. Now, that is an evil act, right? Right. I grew up Catholic, and we used to sing stories about Joshua. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, right? Right. Read the Bible. Read the story of Joshua. What did he do? What did his army do when the walls came tumbling down? They went into Jericho, and they killed every man, every woman, every child, and every animal. It doesn't make sense to me that the drow did this, and they're evil. Joshua did this, and he's a hero in the Bible. Those are the kind of things that I try to solve in my head and in my heart when I'm writing books. And and that's that's something that uh, uh, you know as, as a writer we we get to wrestle with those things and we get to play out the what if scenarios. But also as readers we get to go on these journeys. Um, I I I like to think that 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 experience is kind of elevated for the writer because you're getting to do that. But you know we also get to participate in in the reading of those kinds of stories, which is which is unique in itself. And that's why I think Dritz's journal entries have been so important to me through the books, because he doesn't get it either. You know, he's he's (laughs) kind of in the place I am trying to say, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, You know, one of the things I've heard recently is, well, you have the dark elves in your book and they're evil. And I like, are they any more evil than the other the other cultures that I'm showing in my books, really? Prisoners' Carnival in Luskin, where they torture people to death to cheer in crowds. Those aren't dark elves. They're humans. That's as bad as anything the drow do. So, exactly. hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll be beginning to have better conversations about things like this as we go forward. Maybe the whole, maybe the whole world is starting to ask themselves these types of questions. Because really, it's been a pretty messed up world for the <laughs> two thousand, the five thousand years of human history, of modern human history, if you will, uh, since, since the pyramids. It's been a pretty messed up world when you when you sit back and look at what people do to other people. That's pretty messed up stuff. Noveler is the best way to write a novel. Why? Quite simply, because we've made it the easiest place to do it. Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics, goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need, Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily. It's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox. 
It allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches like allowing you to write both offline and online, unique for a web-based platform. Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's Couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year. And it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world settings safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind-the-scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom-built world-building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki-style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 250,000 world builders, including professional authors. Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too. We're a long way from Star Trek. (laughs) Yes, yes we are. Yes we are. Um, Bob, you've mentioned uh, Drizzt a, a few times and the last time we talked you told us this great story of of how, you know, you just, you created him off the cuff, um, that, that phone conversation. Um, and I'll put a link to that, uh, previous chat that we had so people can go catch up. Um, but that's so amazing. I love that story, but looking back now, you have, uh, you've written Drizzt over 30 novels. How, How many, how many books, how many stories are there of him now? I think there are 36 books. That's insane. And not that doesn't count like the Stone of Tomorrow trilogy or the Cleric Quintet either. <laughs> Plus there's a bunch of short stories and yeah, it's been a 33 year journey. That that's in, insane. Um so you have spent time uh and we'll kind of air quote that um with this character that you created for more than 33 years. Yeah. Uh you know, for for a, a made up character, he has to he has to be one of your best friends at this point. You, you've spent so much time with him. Um, uh, do you ever think of him as a real person? No. no. <laughs> when I'm writing, yes. Because if you don't, the characters won't be real. Yeah. Um, but no, not not in the way you're, you're intimating. <laughs> I haven't completely <laughs> lost my mind yet. Well, there's, Close, there's hope not completely. yet. COVID yeah. may push me over there. Oh, Lord, Lord. Um, speaking of COVID, you know, we, we've got to touch on this. But, you know, for for most writers, we spend a lot of our time in a room alone, uh, you know, with made up characters. Um, so COVID should not on the surface have made much of a difference to a, a lot of writers. But I've heard stories uh, of how the mental aspects of what's been going on. 
have affected people. Uh, you know, it, it's it's a weird time in the world. Uh, has has this time changed you or your process in any way? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I t- I took well. First of all, I was I had already taken four months off. I had determined at the beginning of this year, January to uh, May, when I'm out in California those months, and we're down by the beach, and there's a lot to do. And I said, I'm going to take a vacation. I hadn't had a vacation in 33 years, really. I just <laughs> didn't write, didn't even think about writing. I had yeah. finished up the Coven series, which the last book came out in January, that um, Song of a Risen God. That was done. That was my Demon Wars world. And I had finished Relentless, and I had no contracts for anything. So I said, you know, I'm not going to. I'm just going to sit back and let the world go by and kind of recharge the batteries for a few months. So that was different to begin with. But then when all of this stuff started happening, on top of everything else, because even before, let's let's be real, even before COVID came out, there were a lot of people who were walking around with a lot of stress. Yeah. We have, you know, you, especially in this country, but not just in this country, but in this country right now, you've got people lining up on opposite sides of the streets and throwing things at each other. And that, that's happening in families, that's happening in workplaces, that's happening in relationships, marriages break up because of it. Uh, it is, this is not a good place right now to be for anybody. Left, right, center, it's not a good place to be. Yeah. Everybody's talking past each other, everybody's ready to fight or draw guns and shoot. And it is remarkable to me that we've gotten to this point. That takes a toll. Look, what's going on around you in the world influences your writing. There's no there's no way around that. I remember when I wrote the Cleric Quintet. I don't know if you're old enough to remember this. Yeah, yeah. You probably are. But uh, barely. But I was old. <laughs> <laughs> the first Gulf War was going on. Yeah. And every day there were briefings that came on CNN which was pretty much the only 24-hour news station that was going on. Right. Where Schwarzkopf would give his briefings right. on what was going on on the ground. This is where Wolf Blitzer's uh, career took off. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Wolf Blitzer and one other anchor were in Baghdad when that whole thing started. And Well, anyway... When I wrote the first book in the Cleric Quintet, the biggest edit I had on the book was taking out the phrase hunkering down out of the book. Because <laughs> Schwarzkopf always would say, they're hunkered down here. They're hunkered right. down there. You can't ignore the world around you. Right. And, you know, it's funny because when we did the Dritz Collected Stories, I had to go back and annotate it, where I would say what I was thinking about when I wrote those short stories. Reading those short stories was like looking through a photo album. As soon right. as I read one, I knew exactly where I was, exactly when I wrote it. I knew exactly what my life was like when I when I wrote it. I knew exactly what was going on around me when I wrote it. And so, yeah, I think it definitely has affected people. And now it's it's it it's so crazy. This last year has been so crazy that. A lot of people are having time finding the mental space to escape enough to write about something different. So, yeah, it has an effect. It's um, you, you mentioned the short stories and and you mentioned Ray Bradbury earlier and, uh, you know, that he was a, a huge influence on you. And I, I love uh, what he had to say about writing short stories and and how different the the medium of short stories versus novels is and you know Bradbury had this had this great uh thing that he would talk about in encouraging people to write short stories he said you should write one a year one a week for a year because at the end of the year surely you can't write 53 bad stories right you know <laughs> out of out of, 50, out of out of 52 weeks surely you'll hit on something you know um you know which is kind of tongue in cheek but but he's he's right you know it's the the act of doing it over and over and over again you build those muscles up um but writing short fiction and long fiction are very different things very and different. Yeah, and and you talked about going back and reading those short stories and being like a photo album. Um, what's that process like for you? A, a short story versus a novel? 
Do you approach it differently? Do you know from the beginning it's going to be one or the other? Is it intentional or does the story form itself into what it's going to be? Oh, it's intentional. It's, it's very much intent. Very rarely, it might happen that a short story I write, I think I can keep going and make it bigger. Um, that's actually what happened. The first book I wrote was called Echoes of the Fourth Magic. And that was a short story I wrote in high school. Uh, and But when I was writing it, I realized it wasn't really a short story. But now I'm way past that point in my life in, in terms of being surprised like that. I know when I'm going in on a short story a lot more than what I know on a novel. When I'm writing a novel, I know the characters. I know the general adventure they're going on. I think I know how it's going to wind up, but I don't always. Um, but I just let the novel take me on a trip and a journey. Short story, I, you can't really do that. On a short story, I, a short story has to have a point much more than the chapters of a novel. The, the whole novel hopefully will either show character growth or it will take you on a fun adventure or, or bo hopefully both. And it will ask questions of morality, maybe have a little maybe have some kind of a, a parable in there or whatever. I, I don't know. But the short story, you really, it's not a chat. It's not an information dump. It's not a chapter in a novel. It's got to be more than that. It has to have a twist or a, or a purpose. And I don't typically write like that. I'm not comfortable with the medium of short story at all. I've written some I really like. I really love the short story Dark Mirror, which I think is perfect for our times now. And I wrote that in the 90s. Uh, it's when Dritz finds the goblin who right. was a slave. And he realized the evil people are the people, not the goblins. <laughs> yeah, in that instance. Um, I really love the story, short story Bones and Stones, where it's either Puente or Athergate. I don't even remember now. My, my brain is leaking. I'm old. And <laughs> but... <laughs> They go out, it, it was stippled off point, I think, goes out on a battlefield after these dwarves had just had this big battle with some orcs. And there's another orc on the battlefield. And they, they're going out there to, to try to, like, recover what they can of fallen friends or, you know, identify their fallen, that type of thing. The battle's over. And I wrote it wrapped around a Dritz essay. And you had Quint and the orc looking at each other and, like, should we fight? And looking at all the dead orcs and dwarves, they're, they're friends, and they just kind of bow to each other, if you will, in a, in a very modest way. Just, just just kind of acknowledge each other and go on with what they're doing. And I thought that made a big point about the stupidity of war, which was the whole point. Uh, so th there, were, there were several short stories that really stand out to me um, that I've written, but I'm generally not a short story. I want yeah. the characters to talk to me, to take me on a journey. I don't know what I'm writing in a novel after, that's, you know, pages ahead. I don't know what's going to happen. That's the fun. For me. I, I was going to ask if that was part of the fun, the, the, totally. you know, that you're on the journey as much as the reader is. I know the general idea of what I'm doing. And that's why for me, like the last. Probably every book since the companion. So okay. that would be the Companions, the three Codex books, Companions, Codex books, the three Homecoming books, and the three Generations books. So the last 10 books of the Dritz series have really been a payoff of one thing or another that I knew now was the time to put that together, answer those questions from way back, and kind of bring something in the ongoing tale full circle. The last 10 books none more than the one that's coming out have kind of made the shift that I knew we had to make from the beginning regarding Dritz and the dark elves. And I feel really good about that. But other than knowing that general piece, I'm shocked every other day when I'm writing, I'm surprised by what happens. <laughs> I like, yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. 
Um, Bob, we're we're here today to talk about the the release of the new book, Relentless. It's uh, the uh, the third book in the Generations trilogy. Because you have written Drizzt for so long, uh, you know, more than thirty books and over more than thirty years, um, y- you do get the benefit of this idea of payoffs now, don't you? Um, that there are things, you know, that that you have planted for years and years and years that now you get to pay off. Um, that's a great place to be, uh, a, um, it, but b. Um, I know that that you've you've talked about before um, this idea of, of of being able to drop into any of Driz's stories and and start. You know, if, if someone's just discovering you today and they have all these books to choose from, you have written them in such a way that they could pick up any trilogy or, or series and just start or, or book. You know, exactly. Yeah. Um, so how do you balance those things? You know, the, we've got things that you're paying off now that you've, you know, laid the foundation for us for years and years and years, but while keeping them accessible at the same time. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, it's funny because I'll, I'll put things in the books or I'll have something that'll come up to me that I want to put in a book and I'll say, wait a minute, I touched on this character before. Where was that? And I'll go on the line, online and look in the Forgotten Realms wiki to find out which book it was. Then I'll pull up my copy of the book and do the search on it to find out what I had said before. And every time I've done that, it's very strange. And it just shows me how subconsciously I'm attached to my work. It's made sense, logically. This has been a logical progression. There's very few things I go back. At the very beginning, like the biggest thing I've had to do to retrofit what happened before to fit what's happening now was when I wrote Homeland and I knew that I had to change the amount of time Dritz had been on the surface. I mean, in the Underdark before he came to the surface. I just knew it couldn't be 200 years. I had to condense it a little bit. That's like the biggest change I've had to make. Because when I go back and I look at how Jarlaxle, for example, has developed as a character and changed as a character now, because he's very involved in the last few books. When I go back and look at where he came from and how he was, the hints were always there as to what his heart, where his heart was. So as I do the payoff for his story, I'm not changing anything. It's This is who he has always been. It's a logical evolution of the character to this point. And that's pretty good feeling actually but that's happened with every character i I haven't you know it's almost like i know them so well as soon as i put their name back in there any of the major characters which would include the five companions and trary jarl axel you know several other dwarves that have been in there i know who they are i know where they came from and i know where their heart always was and i'm just revealing more of it as the situation allows. So it, it's a really great feeling. There's no, there's not a lot of retrofitting going on. <laughs> One thing I've noticed, Bob, is that the more stories you tell about Drizzt and the, and the world that, that he uh, occupies, um, you would, you know, on the surface, you would think that the world would get smaller the more we know about it and the more you uncover for us because it uh, you know it was kind of like was it Constantine who uh, um, who who cried on his bed because the world had been conquered and there was nothing left to do yeah um, it, you know you would think that it would kind of be like that the more you know about it there's there's less to know but uh, the opposite actually happens the more you write in this world and about these characters the bigger the world gets. And the more stories there are yet to tell, um, 30 some odd books into him, is the world small to you or is it just as limitless as it's always been? It's it's way bigger. <laughs> <laughs> it's way bigger. Um, one of the things I like about writing in a fantasy world is that, you know, early on, when Dritz went to Callumport, way back in Halfling's Young, yeah, and people were shunning him. I got, I remember, I remember a letter I got back in like 1990, 91, something like that, where the the young man asked me, you know, why were they treat? They must have heard of Dritz. Why were they treating him like that? 
they wouldn't have heard of Drizzt. How would they have heard of Drizzt? You know, there's no phone. <laughs> there's no air travel. You have wizards that may teleport here and there, but they got other things on their mind. They're not worrying about spreading the word. Plus, the peasants in any land are completely in a bubble. You know, it, it's so hard. I remember, I remember when I first started writing, one of the things I wanted to do, because I had a very, very fun neighborhood when I was a kid. It was it was. It was this little Italian section of the town that I live in, and we had this small group of friends, and we had some grand escapades because we were bored. So we had to find <laughs> things to do. And I wanted to write like a Waltons like story about growing up with Rusty and Rossi and Lenny and Danny and Chrissy and Jill and Stephanie and, you know, just this gang we had. And, and we were very self-sufficient because those were the days when you came home from school and your mother said, come home when the streetlights are on, get out. And you threw your books on the table, you picked up your baseball glove or your football or your sled, depending on what time of the year it was, and you just romped outside with your friends. Right. And But I never wrote it because I said, well, everybody grows up like that. But it's so different. The world is so different. And, and I think that one of the things that is really important for younger people today who are on the internet and think they know everything about everything is to really learn about not just what happened in big events, but what the world was like because the experiences were so different for people my age and people my kids' age and people their kids' age. And I'm talking about the everyday life. I mean, when I grew up, if we went to the camp in the summer, in one of the more remote towns in central Massachusetts. I'm not talking about the wild wilderness here in the, in the middle of the Rocky Mountains or something. I'm talking about central Massachusetts. There were people who had never left their town. Right. And that was in the 70s, the <laughs> 60s. You know, families had one car. Dad took it to work. Right. So it's just a different world. And those types of things, when you're writing a fantasy book uh, about a fantasy world that's huge, the realms are huge, right? And I was working for a publisher who said, stay out of the way of everybody else and do your own thing. Allowed me to keep making the world bigger just by kind of walking my characters a mile away. It's pretty fantastic. Um, Bob, in each one of your book series, they each accomplish something for your characters. And uh, we we see character growth. We, uh, you know, something something happens for each of them that we can look back on the series. Oh, this is when Driz did this or yeah. this is where we found out this. But what do we learn uh, or how does Driz change um, in the generation series, what what does this series accomplish for you and your characters? It, it's it's to me of Dritz instead of Dritz was so focused on a very small world for most of his life out of necessity. First it was Mensa Berenzan, then it was Icewind Dale, and then even when he and his friends started going different places, they had immediate concerns that they had to take care of whether it was retaking Mithril Hall, defending Mithril Hall, whatever, saving so Regis and Calumport, whatever it was, they had specific things. After Homecoming, which were the last three books I wrote for Wizards, Dritz really had his denouement. He had his moment where he was actually confronted in a tunnel by Loth. She offered him something that he thought he really wanted, and he did really want. And he basically told her to bug off. <laughs> because if she was worth worshipping, she would have given him that, or never taken it from him in the first place, without condition. Well, from that point on, things changed with Dritz, and that's the generation. I actually think the legend of Dritz, really, that's, that's where it ends. And now this is the legend of of who Dritz could become free of everything, free of his past more than anything else. 
So in the Generations trilogy, we have Dritz looking at a wider picture of the purpose of life, what's after life, what really do we need to change in the world, can we really change it? And this has been actually building in the book since The Companions. The Companions was almost a restart because, you know, they all came back. Right. And they all came back with a purpose and had 20 years of experience on top of their previous lives that they had to catch up with Drip. So it was kind of like a restart. That's a great book. If you, if you look at the series and say, ah, I can't start there, that's too long, and I want to read some of the newer books, start with The Companions and just catch up from there. Then go back and read the rest if you're interested. But every book since then has really been leading to Generations. And I never thought, I never knew if I would get to Generations or not, especially when Wizards told me when I was writing Maestro that Hero was the last book they were going to publish. And they weren't publishing anymore, and they owned the character, so that would have been it for him. And, but Generations allowed me to take Dritz to this next level. Instead of being just the guy who's going to lead the battle, he's the guy who's really looking for something more. And if he, and he finds so many answers to his questions in that series. Uh, but he also finds many, many more questions. Right. Well, you mentioned that uh, that Wizards stopped publishing and that, that was going to be the end uh, for the character. This new trilogy is uh, is actually published by HarperCollins, right? Right. Yeah. What kind of deal did you work out with with Harper to to continue this and and <laughs> I had to work how, out how were you able to do that? I can't tell you much about them, but I had to work out a deal with Wizards of the Coast. Uh, my agent called them and I they said, "Look, I, I want to write these books. But we have to come to some kind of an agreement." And so I had to work out a deal with them to allow me to license the books from the, the characters from them. That would also satisfy their need to keep the world cohesive. Right. But I've always been a team player, and so I was a cons- I was consulting with them for most of the for years, uh, a couple of years where I would I would go up there every year and we would talk about what the world is like. So when I'm writing my books, I can make references to like the Rage of Dragons that they did in the game, or, or um, things that were happening in the Neverwinter computer game. So we, it had to be a very cooperative and trust-filled relationship both ways. Because, I mean, if I write a book and then I send it to them for approval and they say no, what am I going to do? I've just spent six, six months of my life working on something that I can't publish. So they had to be trust both ways. And there was, because these people, are, I've worked with them for 20-plus years, uh, so the people that, that allowed me to continue. And we're friends. It's, it's way more than just we've worked kind of in a um, – in a uh, licensee, no, I mean, in a contractor uh, company fashion. Sure. The relationships I have with people up there go way deeper than that. And we've built a good measure of trust both ways. So we were able to make that deal. And then making that deal, I had to come to terms with Harper Collins, with Harper Collins that satisfied the conditions in the in what Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast were willing to offer on the license, and everybody got together, everybody you know, and everybody decided this is how we can do it. Let's see how it goes. And Generations was born, and I think it's been there's been an added benefit to it, and and the added benefit is that I have somebody, the primary editor on the books isn't somebody who works at Wizards of the Coast, he works for HarperCollins. So he's brought an entirely new perspective into drawing different types of things out of me in a lot of ways. That's it, fantastic. It, it has been. And, I, and I'm really happy with the with the way Generations turned out. Um, all three books. I'm very pleased with those books. I got to do things I've been wanting to do for years in going back in time with, Zal, with Jarl Axel and Zach Nefane before Dritz was even born. Right. Uh, for half of each of the books. Although in Relentless, Dritz is born. It kind of goes along with Homeland, but what happened around the events of Homeland. And I've been wanting to do that for 20 years. But 
because of the demands of the game and the demands of other people licensing material for computer games or whatever, it was go forward, go forward, go forward. And now I finally could go back because I had more control over it. That's got to be a great feeling. Um, with with Relentless, uh, book three in the Generations trilogy, closing out that trilogy, um, such an amazing story. I, I'm so glad that you got to go back and 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 paint the rest of this picture chance, for us. Have you read that book yet? Yes, yes, it's amazing. It's uh, it, it was very satisfying uh, conclusion to that. But the people you know, the, who have read it and got back to me said, "How did you get this book done so fast?" I'm like, "What are you talking about?" This <laughs> This book was planned four years ago, and I wrote it a year and a half ago. And they're like, it, it just seems like I just wrote it from today. Yeah, it, it's very, uh, it, it, it very, very much feels like now. Uh, it, it, it's, it's incredible. Um, the question on everyone's mind, though, Bob, is now that this is finished, what do you turn your sights to now? Because, you know, knowing you... Um, you, you're not satisfied to rest on your laurels. You're not satisfied to, to rest on 30 some odd books of Drizzt. There's something always brewing in that mind of yours. Uh, what, what's up next? I don't know. Um, there's the questions when I took the four months off this year, it was to see if I could enjoy life away from books. And I enjoyed the hell out of those months until COVID <laughs> cut it short. I was having a great time with my grandkids and. And um, just kind of soaking in a little bit of life on the outside world instead of at my desk all the time. Um, so the, the work-life balance, if you will, may have changed even before COVID. Um, where I, I'm not retiring. I've considered it very seriously for a while now. But I'm not, I don't think that's in the cards at this point in time. <laughs> It's, um, I, I still want to work on my Demon Wars world. Um, my son and I are turning the game that we did in that Kickstarter from a percentile dice game to a D20 game. And we've been playing that and working on that. Um, and then there's just after the Coven trilogy, I want to see what the world looks like after that trilogy. Not necessarily continuing that story. I don't want to, that story is done. But the world that I left there is ripe with perfect setup for some books I've wanted to write for a long time. So that's that's in my head. Um, and as far as Drift goes, there are there is there may be some more things that I want to do that can be more complicated. But um, you know we're gonna we're gonna see what happens. We're gonna we're gonna let things play. Well, um, when at this point at this point in time, I'm. I'm not willing to say this is coming because <laughs> the only thing I know that's coming right now is an unannounced book that I wrote with someone else. That's something completely different. And I can't really talk about it yet. Um, it was, um, I, I, it was a one-off and I wrote it with somebody cause we wanted to work together and uh, some people wanted it. And um, other than that, I don't know. <laughs> Well, you, you've definitely piqued some interest uh, by that little tidbit there that you just shared, and, and we'll wait for news on that. Uh, but, you know, when when the, the news came out about Wizards and, and their their change in publishing and all of that, um, it, it, it could have uh, been interpreted as, as dire news, but it sounds to me like it's really opened you up to, to all kinds of possibilities. You're now able to stand and... And kind of look out over all the things that you've created, and and, and maybe there's new life that's been breathed into that. I no, I, I was ready to go when I was told. When I was told, I, I'll never forget it. I we my wife and I had gone to Hawaii, and there was a place we were looking at buying, and I almost bought it. And I said, ah, let me get. I have a meeting up at Wizards first. Let me go there first. And I was expecting a contract offer. To do, and I was going to try and get them up to 10 books. So it would be like the contract would take me to my 70th birthday, right? Or 65th birthday or whatever the hell it was going to be. And that would have been like, ah, let's go buy the house. Okay, now we can go buy the house in Hawaii and we can adjust our life to being grandparents and all of that. 
And that's when they told me that the last book they were publishing was Hero. And it was like, oops, how'd that happen? It kind of caught me by surprise. Um, had Hero been the last book in the Dritz series, it would have been, a, I would have been okay with that. I'm glad it didn't turn out that way because I really like Generations. But um, there's a big part of me that wishes Wizards was still publishing books and doing, you know, a dozen Realms book a, books a year or half a dozen, half a dozen Dragonlance books a year. Just because those worlds were so alive to me as a right. reader. And, you know, I get to talk to Aaron Evans and Paul Kemp and all the other authors, Richard Lee Byers. And, you know, I get to Troy Denning and I are dear friends. I, I miss that. And Wizards now is really more of, seems more of a licensing house now. They've got a lot of licensees, uh, you know, doing Neverwinter game. The, the Dark Alliance game is coming out soon with the Companions of the Hall. And I worked with two games on that a little bit. Uh, you know, we got my, I don't know if you, you, you the people hearing this can't see it, but you can. Uh, I got my little Funko Pop Dritz and Guinevere up there. Love it. Uh, so things are getting kind of crazy in a good way with all of that. I wish Wizards was still publishing books, uh, but I'm happy that they trusted me enough to let me keep going because I think there was more to say. Absolutely. If if Generations is the last trilogy that we ever get to see uh, about Drizzt, then then it'll be satisfying for people. Um, knowing you, it. I, I know this is probably not the last we see of it, um, but there are links to the new book. The new book is called Relentless. We've got links to it in the show notes of this episode. Bob, if if people want to dig into all of the amazing stuff that you've done over the years, uh, where can they connect with you online? You can connect. Well, I have a Facebook page. It's our capital A Salvatore. Small A is my private account. Don't connect with me there. Connect with me on my <laughs> Don't connect me on my personal page. Go to the other page. I do answer my PMs, but I can be months behind. them. I don't go on social. I try to avoid social media a little bit more. I do have a blue checkmark Twitter account, R.A. Salvatore. Um, that's out there. I think it's R underscore A underscore Salvatore or something. I don't know. Uh, I'm on Twitter quite a bit. Um, and then if people want to get signed books, for new books coming out, and go to R.A. Salva store, like bad dad jokes, <laughs> Salva store, it's got the salvatore.com. That's my wife's online store. You can get new or old books signed there. And there's R.A. Salvatore.com, basically runs e signings as well for the newer books. So I'm around, uh, and hopefully post COVID, I'll. One thing, one thing that this kind of forced quarantine has done for me, and I think for a lot of people, is it's made me miss normal and appreciate normal a lot more than I used to. Like, I used to have a convention coming up, and I'd be like, oh, God, I got a convention coming up. And now it's like, I can't wait to go to my next convention. You know, I was supposed <laughs> to be the guest of honor at Gen Con right now, and there's no Gen Con. So we're yeah. doing some online stuff with that. But... Next year, if there's a Gen Con, I'll be the I'll be the guest of honor at Gen Con in person. If we have, if it's safe, you know, I have to be careful with this COVID thing because I'm in my 60s, and I'm in my 60s, and um, I got hit with a softball a few years ago, and it led to a blood clot in my leg, and they say that kind of makes the risk a little higher, so to speak. And plus, I have grandkids, so and I have very important big family around me that. I don't want to put anyone at risk. Yeah. So, absolutely. you know, that's how you can get in touch with me. <laughs> we'll put links to all of those great places where folks can uh, connect with you uh, in the show notes of this episode. The new book, Relentless, uh, a Drizzt novel, Generations Book 3, is out now uh, in in uh, hardcover, Kindle edition, audiobook. Go grab it whichever way that you love to consume uh, your R.A. Salvatore books. Uh, Bob, this has been so much fun catching up. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Stay oh, safe and healthy out there. You too, and thanks for asking me back. It was a good time. Screw 
Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at scribophile.community.